homes out there. Oh, is that the two shot? Yep, no worries. Good morning and welcome to the regular meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Today's date is Wednesday, June 7th, 2023. Uh, we will begin, uh, this meeting will not come to order, we'll begin with a moment of silence. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Madam City Clerk, will you please call the roll? Uh, before I call the roll, I would like to announce that members Benny and York and alternates King and Schwartz have asked to be excused, and I will mark them so. Apking? Here. Botana? Here. Marker? Here. Severson? Here. Summers? Here. Five present, four excused. Thank you. Uh, our next item on the agenda is approval of minutes. A copy of the April 5th, 2023 regular meeting minutes were included for your review in the backup material. Uh, is there any discussion from the members? I move that we accept that. Motion to approve the April 5th, 2023 meeting minutes as presented. Motion made by Commissioner Botana, second by Commissioner Somers. Madam City Clerk, will you please call the roll? Apking? Aye. Botana? Aye. Marker? Aye. Severson? Aye. Summers? Aye. Five eyes. Motion carried. Thank you. All right, our next item is item 7A, ord Ordinance 47 23. Uh, does staff has a pr have a presentation? Good morning, commissioners. For the record, Amy Yearsley with the City Planning Division. Ordinance 47-23 is an ordinance brought forward by Mayor Gunter. This particular ordinance amends Article 5, our accessory structure section of our land development code, and adds the ability to place concrete fences and walls within the PUE with a hold harmless agreement. So that is the basic change that's being proposed. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, this is a public hearing. I'll open up to uh, public input. If there's any members of the public that would wish to speak, please direct yourself to this podium right here, um, and we can uh, hear from anyone. Seeing none, I will now close citizens' input. Is there any discussion from the members? Do we have a motion? Mr. Chair, I, I wonder if we might get a little history on the background on this. I, I read through it a little bit, but I, I was just curious as to what precipitated this uh, process, this request. I would refer to the city. I don't know that I can speak to uh, the mayor's intent with this, but I can uh, state that historically, prior to 2019, we did allow concrete fences as an option um, that was removed in the changes when we adopted the new land development code and this puts that option back in is there any other discussion from the members seeing none do we have a motion motion to approve Motion to approve ordinance 47-23, motion made by Commissioner Apkin, second by Commissioner Somers. Madam City Clerk, will you please call the roll? Apkin? Aye. Botana? Aye. Marker? Aye. Severson? Aye. Summers? Aye. Five ayes, motion carried. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is item 7B, ordinance 50-23. Does staff have a presentation? 
Good morning, Justin Heller, City Planner with the uh, Cape Coral Planning Division. I do have a presentation for you here. All right, this is a uh, city initiated request um, for changing the future land use of about 140 properties along Diplomat Parkway East, um, more particularly in block uh, 2211, lots one through 68, 2219, lots 25 through 60, uh, block 2220, lots one through 66, and block 2221, lots 17 through 40. The proposed change is multifamily uh, to commercial professional. So we're proposing this change um, for these parcels totaling about 14.6 acres up in the Northeast Cape uh, for multifamily to commercial professional in order to allow new commercial development to occur in these blocks. Uh, the proposed changes will bring consistency with the current zoning of these parcels um, currently, uh, the sites have a multifamily future land use, but they have a commercial zoning. Uh, so the goal is this to make the future land use and zoning consistent with each other so that those parcels can be developed by the property owners. Currently, there's only one improved parcel, uh, which has a church on it. And overall, the parcels are small and range in size from about 3,125 square feet of the smallest up to 26,443 square feet. Uh, here I have a map for you just showing the general location of those parcels up in Northeast Cape along Diplomat. And here's our existing and proposed uh, future land use maps uh, existing going to be on the left and proposed on the right. So we analyze this um, with our comprehensive plan, uh, looking for consistency with the comprehensive plan. Um, we found it consistent with policy 1.15c, the future land use element, uh, the proposed commercial Professional future land use is consistent with our um, commercial zoning. Policy 8.5, the city encourages the use of multifamily residential um, compound building, professional offices and parks as transitional uses between the commercial development and low density residential. Uh, so staff finds that this um, proposed commercial professional parcels are located adjacent to multifamily uh, future land use um, lands and so these multifamily lands will serve as a tra transitional use between the commercial and the low density residential sites nearby. Policy 1.13, this policy aims to promote commercial future land use designations and commercial development along commercial nodes. Um, staff finds the site would be considered an extension of a commercial node at Del Prado Boulevard North and Diplomat Parkway East uh, would also connect to the commercial node at Diplomat and Northeast 24th Avenue. Um, so we also looked at our commercial sitting guidelines and policy 1.14. The first uh, guideline is major intersection, uh, preferred locations, our commercial properties are in the vicinity of major intersections. So we found that the, um, the sites would be considered an expansion of the commercial node at Del Prado Boulevard North and Diplomat Parkway East. It would also be um, located at the major intersection of Diplomat Parkway East and Northeast 24th Avenue. Uh, the subject parcels will ultimately connect these two commercial nodes together. So we found that this guideline is met. Adequate depth, ideally, commercial property should have a depth of about 250 feet. Um, these parcels have a depth of about 125 to 135 feet. Uh, let's see. Basically, um, you can't combine these sites because there's an alley in between them on most of the blocks. Uh, additionally, uh, block 220 
sorry, 2220, was previously vacated the alley, and the back half of that block is RML, of which two thirds are already improved with residences. Um, so we did find that this guideline is not met. Compactness uh, measures the ability of a property proposed for commercial future land use to take advantage of economies of scale. Ideal shape would be square or rectangular. Uh, we did find that the properties are rectangular in shape and compact, so we found this guideline is met. Integration, uh, this refers to the interrelatedness of development within a commercial node or area. Uh, staff found that the site is between commercial professional land to the west and Pine Island Road District land to the east. Uh, there's no current infrastructure integrating the site with the commercial node, however, the alleyways could be developed and used to connect some of the properties um, and reduce traffic on Diplomat. Also, future sidewalks could be installed to promote connectivity for pedestrians. So we found that this guideline was partially met. Assembly, um, assembly of pre platted parcels uh, into tracts of three acres or more will promote the development of commercial properties that do not express indicators of strip commercial relevant. Uh, we find that these parcels are small, so assembly will be required for uh, viable commercial projects in this area. There has been some land assembly efforts, um, multiple properties owned by a single owner. Uh, the sites do have the opportunity to reach the desired size threshold through assembly, but there would be strip commercial development, giving that full block depth is not available. So we found that this guideline is partially met. Intrusion, this uh, evaluates the potential adverse impacts on surrounding properties that could be caused by uh, converting a property from its existing future land use to a commercial use. Staff finds um, there is no commercial development uh, adjacent or in the block currently. Um, north and south are developed with duplex and single family homes. Um, so this future land use would introduce commercial development into a residential area. Um, the development exceeds 25% threshold stated in the commercial setting guideline. Um, so new commercial development is likely to have some intrusion to this residential area. Uh, so we found that this guideline was not met. Access, properties should have access uh, via a city parking area or direct access onto an arterial or collector roadway. Uh, we found that the subject parcels um, don't have access to a platted city parking area, but they do have frontage on Diplomat Parkway East, which is a minor arterial. And additionally, two parcels have frontage on Northeast 24th Ave, which is a collector road. So we did find that this guideline is met. Ownership pattern, um, an ideal commercial node is a cohesive, compact, interrelated network of commercial properties. Um, multiple small properties under separate ownership, um, even if such properties are included in a, in a single uh, future land use amendment request, may not be appropriate for the full array of commercial uses. Staff finds that um, these parcels are small, consisting of one to three lot platted sites, and again, assembly would be necessary for viable commercial projects in the area. Um, the 140 or so parcels have 80 different owners, so there is some land assembly efforts, um, but even with assembly, there would be strip commercial development. So staff found that this guideline is also not met. In summary, uh, the proposed amendment meets three of our commercial sitting guidelines, partially meets two, and doesn't meet three. Policy 1.14 doesn't require that a proposed amendment meets a certain threshold of the guidelines um, for approval or denial. Rather, they're meant to provide a compatibility analysis. Uh, based on our, our analysis, um, while not optimal, we do find that um, they would be suitable for commercial development. We also looked at development impact um, analysis for these properties. Uh, we find that the amendment would result in a small increase in water and sewer demand and increases in solid waste services by transitioning to commercial. Um, would also increase uh, the peak number 
of uh, trip hours generated. The future land use amendment would also result in a decrease in dwelling units going to commercial. Um, as a result, uh, there would be slight decrease in population and a decrease in students. Our overall recommendation is approval of the small scale future land use amendment. And again, I just wanna state that this is to bring consistency between the future land use and zoning so that these properties can be developed in the future. That's all I have and I'll stand by if you have any questions. Thank you, Justin. This is a public hearing. I'd like to now open up to public input. If any of the member, members of the audience wish to speak, please direct yourself to the podium and state your name for the record. My name is Robert Durand. My wife, Denise, and I live on uh, 2120 Northeast 15th Lane in Cape Coral. Uh, we've been, we purchased that lot and built a home in 2003. Um, we are strongly opposed to this zoning change proposal, and here's why. We feel that uh, the uh, zoning change is definitely not necessary and and harms the affected homeowners. The existing Pine Island businesses and the Merchants Crossing Corner business complex already provide adequate choices for shopping, dining, and all the ordinary necessities needed for local residents. This change will destroy the residential feel of the neighborhood. It will create unwanted visual pollution for everyone affected especially the residents of properties on Northeast 15th Lane who don't want to look at the back of a future dollar store or similar. That isn't what present owners thought they were buying when they purchased their lots. The, pro the proposed change would immediately diminish rather than enhance the neighborhood it will severely impact the property values of and desirability of homes within visual range of any new commercial activities. Imagine the look and smell of dumpsters behind a small restaurant. Clearly the people in instigating the change don't plan to live there. It will adversely affect current traffic flows adjacent to Diplomat Parkway especially increasing traffic on Northeast 15th Lane, which will become a potential bypass route between Northeast 24th Avenue and Del Prado Boulevard to avoid a now busier Diplomat Parkway. It creates a safety hazard for residents, pedestrians, and school buses. The zoning change document describes Northeast 24th Avenue at Diplomat Parkway as a major intersection. It is now a two lane road with a four way stop. It is not a major intersection and there are no commercial activities on the corners or anywhere near it. In fact, there is a new multifamily dwelling being built on the Northeast corner of 15th Lane and Northeast 24th Avenue with another home being built next door. These new homes, if this ordinance were connected, could be back to back with businesses, which definitely makes them less attractive to home buyers or renters. Even the staff who wrote this proposal indicate it's a toss up whether this area meets the change requirements or not. The main benefits of the zoning change go to a few developers whose motives are profit. They will cash out and as quickly as possible and move on. There is no need to encourage commerce here. A, a residential neighborhood is already here. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. If there's any other members of the public that wish to speak, please direct yourself to the podium. Seeing none. We'll close citizens input. I'll turn it over to the commission. Any comments from the commissioners? 
Commissioner Botan? Yes, uh, I, I had a question, uh, and it's not really explained in here to me. Uh, and what is marked on the exhibits as uh, the uh, subject properties, there's on the, the very first time they appear, uh, they're red. Some of uh, there's little lines like some are white and some are red. I'm just wondering what the difference is. Are some of those sites already developed and others are not? Is that why there's different colored things on there? Are you referring to this? Uh, yeah, this there's right black here. and red. So the, the map on the, the left shows the, I know it's real small, so it's hard to see here. Yeah, I can get a little bigger. So this is currently, you know, the whole block um, has the multifamily um, residential future land use. And then this is just showing what it would look like with the change. Um, so now this portion would change over. Um, why are why are some of them little blocks black and some of them red? It's just the thickness of the line, I guess, because these parcels are so it's small. All undeveloped now, is that what you're it's saying? All undeveloped except for one out of 140 parcels has a church on it. It has what on it? One one has a church. A church Everything okay. else is vacant on those on those properties. The black lines are the actually the lot line it's yes yeah, it's the, it's the, the lot, lot line. Line. yeah you know it, it's just there's so many and this the scale of it it just okay. It, okay if you eliminate the lot lines it's all red on the right side my right side uh, picture and, and brown on, on the other side it would be all brown okay. yeah i just didn't know if that represented some of the lots being sold and you developed already or not i I had the same question when I saw this. About <laughs> I'm glad I ago. asked that. So, you know, great minds think alike. So. so as you can see, I mean, we already have the commercial um, uses to the east and west of here and a little bit to the north. Uh, we do have some existing commercial professional and Pine Island Road District. This is um, kind of connecting those commercial areas and creating um, a linear commercial strip between the two big hubs so it, you also said that a lot of the uh, lot there's different ownership of a lot of the lots so there would have to be some consolidation in order for anything to be developed there yeah and even if these were multifamily most of these parcels are only 3,000 square feet and you need 10,000 square feet to build a house so um, even if you know, we, we went with a uh, different direction. There would have to be assembly. Regardless of which direction we go, people are gonna have to assemble lands out there to be able to build. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner Severson. <clears throat> Just a couple of logistical questions. And, and the provisions that are made for the easement for the alley that's split up between low dense, or high density housing and the commercial node there. Is that a responsibility of the owners or uh, of the property, adjoining properties, or is that part of the Lee County? Uh, Those alleys would be developed when the, the commercial properties came in. So as each parcel came in, they would be required to develop the alley behind their, their commercial site and pave it. So when you say that the adjoining <coughs> properties are, are not an option, for someone to buy the commercial node and then buy the property on the other side of the alley to create the 250 foot depth for optimal use. That's why. Yeah, yeah. in this case, um, they really wouldn't have that option. I mean, if they bought the end cap, maybe they could come in and do a vacation of alley um, and a, a rezone on those uh, multifamily properties to the south. But for the most part, it's going to be strip development along diplomat there so just for my information the, the the commercial portion is buffered from the single family development by the multi-family uh, buffers yeah there will be a multi-family strip separating the single family to the south 
in between. So the proposition that was brought up by the prior residents in the area was that he didn't want to be looking in the back of a commercial property that would be buffered by a multifamily uh, basically Cor correct. function. Correct, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any additional comments from the commission? I would have some myself. Uh, I do have concerns. Uh, I, I understand the city's desire to expand uh, commercial land in the city of Cape, something that you know the city's been working on for years and years now. Uh, but just looking to the comprehensive plan analysis um, and taking a look at these properties in that surrounding area, it certainly is not ideal um, for commercial by any means. Uh, and in my opinion, would be somewhat intrusive at this point. Uh, but I do understand the city's desire uh, that runs uh, against that. But there's no more comments from the commission. Oh, Severson. I didn't want to uh, dominate here, but I, I do have a couple other questions, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the study, it talked about a decrease in student population. I'm just curious how you calculate that. Um, there's a more detailed analysis, I guess, in the staff report. Um, basically, we we run some estimated numbers based off of um, what the maximum multifamily housing would have, and then the average number of students per household for multifamily. And by showing a change in acreage from multifamily to okay. commercial that's how we do those calculations so they're they're really just estimates um you know just to give you an idea of Got the it. potential impacts Got it. okay i understand thank you i have no further questions any additional comments do we have a motion do we have a second Motion to approve Ordinance 50-23, motion made by Commissioner Apkin, second by Commissioner Botana. Madam City Clerk, will you please call the roll? Apkin? Aye. Botana? Aye. Marker? Nay. Severson? Nay. Somers? Aye. Three ayes, two nays, motion carried. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. Next on the agenda is item 7C, ordinance 51-23. Does the applicant or the city wish to speak at this time? I do. Good morning, commissioners. For the record, Chad Boyko, principal planner with the city's planning division. We have a PowerPoint presentation for you here in just a minute while it loads up. All right, so what we have before you today is ordinance 51-23. This is a privately initiated future land use map amendment. Uh, the applicant for this is Acorn Entrada LLC. It's located at the northeast corner of the Del Prado Boulevard and De Navarra Parkway intersection. It's 25 acres out of a larger tract that is about 50 acres in size, and we'll kind of go into that a little bit later. Uh, it's currently within the transition area of the urban services boundary. Uh, there are utilities that are available to this site, so that's why it's in the transition area. And then the applicant's request is a future land use map amendment from the mixed use or MX future land use designation to the multifamily residential future land use designation. Uh, before we move on, let's take a look at the aerial map you have before you. You can kind of see that the overall parcel that is in red that kind of goes outside of where the map amendment area is, that's around 50 acres. That is part of an old PDP named Commercial Center at Entrada. And then the applicant's proposing to sort of carve out a chunk of 25 acres relatively in the center of this 50-acre uh, tract. Surrounding development on all four sides. Uh, to the north, you have a residential subdivision that's currently within unincorporated Lee County. To the south, across Del Prado Boulevard, you have a combination of some multifamily units that is within a development named Isles of Porta Vista. And then you also have sort of a... Uh, uh, Commercial, commercial Center at the intersection of De Navarra Parkway and Del Prado Boulevard. To the west, across De Navarra Parkway, you have a undeveloped track that's around 25 acres. And then a little further west, you have uh, Bella Vita subdivision. 
And then to the southwest, you have the Entrada subdivision, which is around uh, 700 single family units. And then also there's an undeveloped tract at that intersection as well. Uh, to the east, uh, you're de generally dealing with mostly unincorporated Lake County area. I believe you have like a gas station that is there. And then a little further east, you have a public shopping center and then some additional residential units there. So with the existing future land use, uh, the entire sort of square mile that's within, it, within this area is mixed use future land use. That includes your Entrada, your uh, Isles of Porta Vista, Bella Vida, all those subdivisions, along with this tract uh, that we're looking at here. And then to the north, you see there's like sort of like a large expanse of gray area that's to the north and that's further to the, to the east. That is areas that's within unincorporated Lee County. We don't have any designation for that. And then the proposed future land use, you can see on the right-hand ma right map uh, screen, is the subject uh, land use area that will take the sort of interior 25 acres and change that to multifamily residential designation. So quick findings of fact, we mentioned that it's about, 50, it's about half of the current 50 acre tract that they're looking to propose, around 25 acres. The entire parcel is undeveloped. Uh, it is at the intersection of Del Prado Boulevard, which is a principal arterial, which is the highest class roadway that we have within, Le within Cape Coral, and then Day Navarre Parkway, which is a collector road, uh, which is one step above your local roads. Uh, this was part of a PDP that was titled Commercial Center at Entrada. That was originally approved around 2004, 2005. At that time, the PDP approved around a quarter million square feet of commercial uses, along with eight multifamily units that was within that PDP. It was amended around 2013, 2014 to uh, get rid of the eight multifamily units and then the entire uh, site was zoned to C1. That was back when we had the plan development project process that allowed for like, re it was a different process than we have nowadays with the PUDs. It allowed for rezonings uh, of a site within a plan development project. Uh, and the staff also notes that the amendment would remove commercial entitlements for about 50% of the site. So this is just sort of a map. You can kind of see what happens if this future land use map amendment was approved. Uh, the overall parcel is, is 50 acres in size. Uh, the amendment area is 25 acres. Uh, there is a conservation easement that is located in the north, uh, northwest portion of this property. That's around 10 acres, so nothing can be built on that 10 and a half acre tract, uh, which is a conservation easement. That is sort of off, off the limits for any future development. Uh, you're left with a, there is an LCEC, LCEC easement that's around 100 foot wide. That is on the eastern portion of the property. That's just a little under one acre, and that actually would separate two of the remaining sort of commercial remnant areas, uh, which are about four acres and a little under three acres. So basically what you're looking at if this were to be approved, you would have uh, some remnant areas that could be developed upon. There's four of them. And out of a 50 acre tract, you'd be left with, a with just under uh, 13 acres of commercial development on this site. So we did some analysis for our land development code first, and we'll go into the comp plan analysis later. Uh, we looked at a couple of sections within our LDC. Uh, the first is section 352. This has some standards in terms of how you are analyzing future land use map amendments. Uh, we'll highlight sort of the important ones where there's really some sort of uh, uh, meat on the bone to discuss with this. Uh, the first standard is whether the amendment results in compatible land uses within a specified area. Uh, staff's response is that the proposed amendment would likely result in multifamily units. Uh, you do have similar uses that are developed uh, to the south across Del Prado Boulevard within that one multifamily development. Uh, there's also some multifamily that is located to the west uh, within the uh, Bella Vita Parkway. This, the existing land use is also compatible with the existing land uses as there's also some commercial development that's located to the south across Del Parto Boulevard. Another standard that we looked at is whether the amendment prepares the city for future growth uh, and you know, for, developing, for identifying population growth and keeping up with development patterns. Uh, staff's response is that the amendment would not uh, prepare the city for future growth within this area. You already have sort of a, a, a nice concentrated area of residential development within this sort of square mile uh, at this intersection of Del Prado Boulevard and Danavar Parkway. Uh, there's already, you know, three subdivisions that are being built or have been built within this area. Uh, the amendment that you're looking at would strip this uh, corridor with the potential for commercial land. Uh, and with, when you're stripping that, you're you know, eliminating things for goods and services as well as potential uh, job opportunities 
for uh, this area of the city of Cape Coral. Um, we've already mentioned that it's heavily residential and taking away that would not sort of prepare the city for the future growth or the current growth that you're experiencing within this area. Uh, we also looked at whether the amendment protects the health, safety, and welfare of the community. Uh, staff finds that there would be some short-term protection due to a slightly less in intensive use uh, with multifamily units. Generally, you look at multifamily as being a little less intense than commercial uses. Uh, however, staff finds that the long-term welfare of the community is hampered due to the loss of commercial that can provide for economic benefits, uh, being you know, tax and sales revenue, and then also employment opportunities. Additional long-term effects include longer trips for residents to nearby commercial areas. Establishing a commercial, ba a commercial base here on this site would allow, allow for a rapidly growing area uh, to have good services and employment opportunities. Uh, the next area that we looked at is whether the proposed amendment in all of the consistent zone districts and underlying uses are compatible with the physical and environmental features of the site. Uh, staff finds that the site has sufficient size, width, and depth for both multifamily and commercial development. Uh, future development will also likely have access from Del Prado Boulevard and Dana Barra Parkway. So you do have the infrastructure, uh, the roadway capacity, and utilities there to allow for either multifamily or commercial development. Uh, staff, uh, the next that we looked at is the site is capable of accommodating all of the allowed uses, whether by right or otherwise, considering existing or planned infrastructure for roads, uh, sanitary and water supply systems, and stormwater parks, et cetera. Uh, staff finds that the site was originally planned for a more intensive future land use designation with a mixed use designation. Therefore, the site does has, have the adequate infrastructure to accommodate commercial mixed use and multifamily development on the site. Uh, we also looked at our comprehensive plan. Uh, the first policy we looked at was chapter three, which, which is the housing element goal. Uh, this goal is to provide good quality housing and safe, clean neighborhoods, offering a broad choice of options in both type, single family and multifamily, and tenure, both owner and renter occupied, to meet the needs of the present and future residents of the city, regardless of age or income status. Staff's response is that if the amendment is approved, likely development would be multifamily units. Uh, studies have shown that the multifamily residential is needed in the city of Cape Coral. We've done two studies previously, and we just released a third study. Um, the most recent study shows that Cape Coral is actually fairly well suited now for market rate housing. Uh, when the two studies were done, we were looking at a deficit of around 1,000 to 1,500 units being constructed per year. The new study shows that we only really need around, I think it's, uh, 80 market rate units to sort of meet that need for the residents of Cape Coral. Uh, what it does show that we're still lacking is, uh, is sort of that workforce or attainable housing that meets sort of a lower income threshold within the city of Cape Coral. Um, so staff finds that seeing as though we are sort of set with market rate housing, unless the product that is produced on this site is that attainable or workforce housing, uh, the benefit to the community would actually be marginal with the addition of however many residential units that they would put on this site. Uh, we also looked at our future land use element, chapter four. Uh, we looked firstly at the eight commercial siting guidelines that kind of determines whether or not a site is appropriate or not appropriate for a commercial or non-residential land use designation. Uh, those guidelines are major intersection, adequate depth, compactness, integration, assembly, intrusion, uh, and ownership pattern and access. Uh, staff's response is that when we analyze per these eight guidelines, it is actually the current mixed use designation is consistent with seven commercial siting guidelines. Uh, you have major intersection. We've already mentioned that it's at a collector and arterial roadway intersection. It has adequate depth. It's 25 acres. It's a, it's a large site. Um, it's relatively compact. It's not, not your perfect rectangle, but there is some compactness to it. It's not an irregular shaped property, so it does meet that standard. Uh, assembly, it is a large parcel that is assembled under one ownership. Uh, there's integration opportunities to go along with the entire site being 50 acres. Uh, you've got integration that can go along with inside the site. Um, intrusion, you already have some commercial development that's existing across uh, Del Prado Boulevard, so there really, really wouldn't, you wouldn't be introducing uh, new uses into this area that aren't already existing. Um, ownership pattern, once again, we mentioned that it's a large site under one, under one owner. Um, the current designation is not consistent with one guideline, which is access. 
And that's sort of peculiar given that it's on an arterial roadway. The access guideline states that in order for a site to be consistent with this guideline, it has to be either on a roadway with an access management plan, which is only around two or three that are in Cape Coral, or it needs to be near a city owned parking lot. Uh, and the furthest one is around two miles away from this. So that's why it doesn't not meet that access guideline. Uh, we also looked at this per the uh, compatibility table, which sort of states which land use designations are consistent with, consistent with which zoning designations. Um, the proposed multifamily designation is not compatible with the current uh, commercial or C zoning district. Future development of this site, if this amendment was approved, would need a rezone to the RML, RMM, or a PUD uh, zoning district in order to build multifamily units. The site is 25 acres in size, and the multifamily designation allows a maximum density of 25 units per acre. So if this site, after approval of a, a land use amendment, and a rezone were developed to its maximum potential, you'd be looking at 625 units. The current mixed use de designation is compatible with the C district. Uh, current development potential for the 25 acre site is 125 freestanding units because the mixed use designation only allows for 20% of a site to be developed with freestanding residential uses. Um, you'd be looking at if this was developed at an FAR of 1.0, there's an allowable intensity of a little over a million square feet of commercial space. That's a high number. Uh, FAR of 1.0 has uh, never been built within Cape Coral. Usually it's built around an FAR of uh, 0 0.25, 0 0.3, around that. So you'd be looking at around 25% of that 1 million square feet that's developed, developed there. The mixed use designation also allows for mixed use development. So you could, if you were gonna completely max this, si this site out for development, you could still get your 625 units within mixed use integrated buildings and also get your million square feet of commercial space. Um, that's a uh, unlikely scenario, but if you do mixed use, you can still sort of max out both of those multifamily and commercial components within this site. We also looked at this per, we have uh, around three years ago, we adopted some multifamily siting guidelines. We have four of those. Uh, we have proximity to major roadways, proximity to non-residential uses, transition from commercial uses to non-residential uses, and then assemblage opportunities. Staff finds that the site is consistent with two guidelines, which are proximity to major roadways, it's got access and frontage on an arterial roadway, and then also proximity to non-residential uses. Uh, it's you know, just across the street from, the, from existing commercial along Del Prado Boulevard. Uh, staff finds that the proposed designation of multifamily is not consistent with two guidelines, which are transition from non-residential uses and then assemblage opportunities. Uh, the first one with the transition from non-residential uses, if this was developed and changed to multifamily, it's really only buffering from the uh, residential area that's within Lee County to the north, but the existing commercial uh, that is south of Del Prado Boulevard, it's still over around 5,000, 6,000 feet away from those residential uses within Lee County. So really there's, there's already enough separation there where you're not really providing any additional buffering if this was approved to multifamily. And then lastly, the assemblage opportunities. Uh, there's no, no possibility for assemblage with this site. And then actually you're sort of deassembling this site from the existing uh, commercial or non-residential or mixed use land use that you have there currently. Um, staff also finds that the site meets all criteria for location at a commercial node. You're at the intersection of arterial ro roadway and a collector roadway, so it has all those criteria for a commercial node location. We did a quick little impact analysis, which we've already kind of hit on in our previous presentation. Uh, the existing land use of mixed use allows for, we mentioned over just over a million square feet of commercial at its maximum potential with an FIR of 1.0 uh, proposed within this site would be zero square feet of commercial. So you're losing that potential for a million square feet of non-residential development. Uh, dwelling units that you are, are currently allowed within the mixed use designation is varying between 125 units to 625 units if you're being built within a mixed use building. And then the proposed maximum units are 625. Uh, we kind of broke down the difference as being plus 500 units just for the fact that mixed use development True mixed use has not really occurred very often, so we just kind of kept it safe with that projection. Uh, population, existing populations around 300 people within this area, and then proposed populations a little over 1,500 people within this area. So you're gaining around 1,200 uh, population within this. 
And then the trips, if this was uh, approved to multifamily, you'd be reducing the peak hour trips by about 800, and then you'd be reducing the, the, on the AM, AM peak hour trips by about 800 trips. And then if it was approved, you'd be losing, you'd be decreasing the PM peak hour trips by around 3,500 uh, car trips. Uh, and this was just something that we wanted to show within, we talked about that square mile that we're looking at within this corner of Cape Coral. Um, you already have some existing development. Uh, what we did is we, we took a square mile that's existing uh, within another portion of Cape Coral, uh, just to kind of give you a comparison that the area is already sort of well suited for commercial. Um, within the current square mile where this property is located, you have the Entrada, Bella Vida, and Porta Vista uh, developments, and you're looking at the current uh, CO'd and built development there. You've got around 1,000 single family homes and around 800 multifamily units for just, for eight, you know, you're looking at 1,862 units that are currently constructed within that square mile. And then we looked at a square mile, which is, um, it is east of Chiquita Boulevard, uh, south of Leeson Parkway, west of Skyline, and then north of Mohawk. Um, we took that square mile because it's mostly developed there. There are, there's a library that's within the interior there that kind of removes some units there. And then also you have a commercial development at the intersection of Skyline and Mohawk, which is I think a neighborhood Walmart. Uh, but we just kind of wanted to give a comparison to see what a mostly built out square mile within a, another portion of Cape Coral looks like compared to this one. Uh, this square mile, you had 1,200 single family units, 124, 124 four multifamily units and then 100, 121 duplexes that are built there. So you've got around 1,400 units. So this, the current square mile that you're looking at where the amendment is proposed is already looking at having 400 more residential units than a, than a typical already sort of built out square mile within another portion of the city of Cape Coral. So they've, you've already got a number of units that are within this area without having this amendment approved. So then we just did sort of an appropriateness of mixed use or multifamily residential designation. Uh, the staff finds that based on our analysis with the land development code and the comp plan, the site is generally appropriate for either the mixed use or the multifamily future land use designations. Uh, the, the factors that make a site a good candidate for commercial also generally make a site a good candidate for, for multifamily. Uh, you've got the site's large, it's over three acres, it's assembled into one parcel, there is common ownership of the site, and then the site has uh, sort of ideal access and frontage on our arterial roadway. Uh, it makes it a good candidate for commercial or, or multifamily. Um, staff finds that while multifamily is needed within the city of Cape Coral, we kind of mentioned that we're still looking at uh, workforce housing. Uh, staff finds that the loss of over 25 acres of undivided commercial land um, that is at a commercial node is not within sort of the long range best interest of the city of Cape Coral. Um, there's no guarantee that the final product that's going on the site would be the workforce housing, which is needed rather than market rate multifamily, which is what we're, we're pretty good at right now. Um, we've had, the city of Cape Coral has had a long goal, a long standing goal of achieving a greater balance between uh, commercial and, not, and residential uh, tax base and land use. And then we find that sort of losing that 25 acres is not sort of within the best interest of the city. Uh, growing and maintaining the commercial base is a core element of the City of Cape Coral strategic plan, which was approved by City Council. Uh, the existing designation still has the ability to still allow some multifamily development. We've already mentioned that you've got 125 units that are still allowed there. Um, so you still have some existing capabilities of multifamily designation. Um, staff notes that 25 acres in the grand scheme of things is a small percentage of the commercial land within Cape Coral. Um, however, eliminating that acreage um, in this area of the city um, where we've seen growth in population and housing units is not favorable for Cape Coral. Uh, the acreage has the potential to provide goods and services to nearby homes um, that are existing or are currently being built. Um, so therefore, our recommendation based upon the analysis of the comp plan and the land development code, as planning staff recommends denial of the request to amend the site from the mixed use designation to the multifamily residential designation. And I stand by for any further questions. Thank you, Mr. Borkin. Do we have a presentation from the representative? Thank you.
Good morning, Linda Miller, Vice President of Avalon Engineering. Um, I am very happy to represent this future land use case for the development team. I do have with me this morning the owner of the property, David Bommy. I also have the developer of the multifamily track, Chris Moore, and I also have um, Mike Price from LandQuest. Uh, David and Mike will be also doing some of the presentation slides, so I will bring them up there at their start of the slide. Um, this is Future Land Use Map Amendment 22-00020. Um, it is for 25.14 um, acres from mixed use to multifamily. David? Hi, my name is Dave Famey. I own the uh, Acorn property. Uh, I've been working on this project for well over a year. Um, just give me one second here. Here we go. Um, so I own the 49 acre uh, parcel, it's called Acorn Entrada LLC. I've been working on this for over a year. Based on assurance from the city, we can move forward with the apartment portion of the project. We had a pre-application meeting with the city and we were told that the city would support our use for the 402 unit uh, Class A apartments, which is needed in this part of Cape Coral and Cape Coral in general. Now. I went to the apartment complexes throughout Cape Coral this last weekend, and every one I went to was either full or over 95% full. So there's a tremendous need for apartments in Cape Coral. Uh, this is a mixed use zoning that allows apartments as part of the land use, and the seven proposed parcels making up the 49 acres, six of them will be commercial out parcels. So the majority of this project is commercial. Um, the commercial out parcels need the apartment component to provide customers to, to the commercial businesses that plan on building businesses on these six commercial out parcels. Without the residences, it, it wouldn't support the commercial and vice versa. Uh, the, the project has been dormant with no buyers willing to purchase any of the property for as long as I've owned it, since September 1st, 2018. This property has been vacant since that period of time. It was vacant before I bought it. There has been no offers on it. Um, and as long as it's been established as a mixed use property, there's been absolutely no offers on this property for commercial use, none, zero. Um, my other 6.5 acre parcel on the southwest corner of Del Prado and Di Navarro also has no offers. I'd love to sell it to a commercial buyer, but we haven't had any commercial buyers come to this property. Um, this is the first time this property has been under contract for both the commercial and the apartment components of this project with both buyers of the apartment site and commercial sites expecting benefit from each other's services. Once the retail community of the buyers heard that the apartment project was gonna be under contract, all of a sudden they came, okay, we have apartments there, we have a higher demographic count, now they're interested in that property. Before that, nothing. Uh, the developer next to us reached out to me a number of times to confirm that our apartment project is moving forward to reassure, reassure his future commercial tenants that there will be enough apartment units to support his company. So it's not just my property that will benefit from this development, but the entire market area. That includes the commercial building across from us that has vacancies already. Um, I'd like to touch on a a couple of subjects. There's over 85,000 acres of conservation land within a half a mile of my property, spanning out to 16 miles. 
for my sight, encompassing about 75% of the landmass to the northwest and the northeast. So going from my property a half a mile out to 16 miles, 75% of the landmass is made up of conservation area. You can't build on it. It will never be able to be built on. Uh, currently, there is an ag exemption on this property, and when this property is developed, as currently planned, there will be a massive amount of property tax generated by this project. Right now, it's ag exemption, very little tax is generated on it. Um, I think the biggest problem for this property and why there's been no commercial development on this property, and this is a major problem, is we only have 220 feet of road frontage on Highway 41. That means there's no right turn in from 41 and there's no left turn in from 41. So there's no major shopping center developer that's gonna ever buy this property with no left turn in and no right turn in off of 41. 41 is the main corridor in that part of town and there's no access. The, the amount of cost it's gonna to take to build the shopping center and you can't get a left in or a right in, it just kills the deal. Um, we need 660 feet to get a right in and a left in. We have 220 feet. So we've reached out to FDOT, no go, they're not gonna do it. They said you don't have the land. So that's the, the really the, the biggest problem we have, not counting the population can't support it. In a one mile radius from this property, there's 6,501 people. It's not a large enough population to build a 250,000 square foot shopping center or anything close to that. So that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'm just gonna continue with the presentation, the, the parcel information that Chad had mentioned before. The property is located at 3561 Dina Vera Parkway on the north side of Del Prado Boulevard North and the east side of Dina Vera Parkway. The subject portion of the property is 25.14 acres within the 49.66 acre track. The parcel is located within the city of Cape Coral, just west of the intersection of US 41 in North Fort Myers and Del Prado Boulevard North. Our request, as we mentioned before, is to amend the future land use from mixed use to multifamily for 25.14 acres, um, to develop a multifamily complex with 16 dwelling units per acre for a total of 402 units with six commercial out parcels. The surrounding area, as Chad mentioned, north of us is the residential um, development, Dina, uh, Del Tura. South of us is actually tracks within the Entrada development that was um, created in 2004. Those tracks consist of multifamily and some commercial development on the corner and intersections. To the west of our site is actually, again, more property within the Entrada on both sides of the street to the north and to the south. And those um, sites are undeveloped exception, with the exception of the um, residential development from DR Horton. This is a current future land use map, and as Chad mentioned, everything in this area is mixed use land use. It was done that way in, um, in the Entrada development. This was an old Unit 86 development. Um, it actually had tracks for just RD, which is residential development. We came in and we subdivided those tracks into development tracks, and those created commercial out parcels, commercial track areas, multifamily areas, and also single family. The Entrada original development was for 496 acres. 
This is the current zoning. So we, as you can see that our parcel is zone C commercial and across the street from us is commercial and to the south of us is commercial. And if you can notice from this exhibit, where are the commercial next to us? They're on the corner parcels. So from Del Prado to Dina Vera on both sides of the street and the parcels don't extend very much into the property. They are very related to the corners of these properties. I want to talk about mixed use. As Chad mentioned, we have mixed use land use right now, and it does allow for multifamily units, 20% of the land area. So 49.66 acres, 20% of the land area for that development would only be 9.95 acres. There's no way you can do 25 dwelling units on 9.95 acres for a multifamily complex. It just doesn't work. You need amenities for multifamily, you need parking spaces for multifamily. You would be having high rise buildings with parking underneath to get 25 dwelling units on 9.95 acres. It just is not feasible. So I wanted to give you a couple of slides about how mixed use has changed over the years. So when we first started the project in 2002, mixed use was allowed in Cape Coral and we did have a classification for it. And it said this, large properties are prime candidates for mixed use development. These properties shall include more than one type of use. The land dedicated to the secondary use may not fall below 20% of the total land area of the project. One of the uses must be residential at 16 dwelling units per acre. That exhibit that I have here would mean that we would be able to put 38.93 acres developed as a multifamily development with 622 total units and conserving the um, conservation area and the road drainage that we already have in conservation. In 2005, the mixed use changed a little bit, and it said large properties are prime candidates for mixed use developments. These properties shall include more than one type of use. No single use shall exceed 80% of the total land area, and at least 20% of the total land area should be developed with office, retail, service, and light industrial uses. Then it had a baseline maximum density of 4.4 and a density up to 16 dwelling units with a transfer of development rights. So as you can see from this exhibit, we would be able to do 9.93 acres of commercial, kind of shown where we have in blue, 10.73 is a conservation area, and 29 acres would be for multifamily with a total of 127 units up to 464 units. Today, the mixed use designation is intended to encourage development of planned projects that include more than one type of use. The maximum density is 25 dwelling units per acre. Large properties are prime candidates. These properties shall include more than one type of use. The mix of use shall include residential, may include residential, retail, office, services, light industrial, and public facilities. After October 23, 2010, standalone residential uses may comprise only up to 20% of the site area of a mixed-use property one acre or greater in size. And from this exhibit, you can see that that would be 9.95 acres with a total of 247 units on that. There's no way to get 249 units on that 9.93 acres, and the rest would be commercial. What we're proposing with this future land use map amendment is to provide the city with much needed multifamily units while preserving 13.79 acres of usable area for commercial uses at the intersections. This amount of acreage is greater than what was required when the development was approved and up to a few years ago in 2019. So we'll have 10.73 conservation in, in road drainage, 13.79 in commercial, and 25.14 residential, um, for residential with 402 units. So I went through what um, Chad's um, staff report said, and we disagree with one aspect of his report under section 3.5.2. And that is the amendment provides the city for, this amendment prepares the city for future growth. And we believe it does, you know, we recognize the goal of having commercial near residential. It reduces traffic impacts and trips on adjacent roadways. It provides for a different type of housing alternative. This land use will facilitate a mixed use development, which was envisioned when we first did this project. 
it's, it will permit the amount of density that's viable for a residential development that will support those commercial out parcels. This is um, a requirement for a future land use map amendment to be in compliance with this section of the code. And we agree with the staff report, we are in compliance with these standards um, and Chad went through them already. A couple of things I wanted to point out is the city did this major commercial corridor study and then used that corridor study to prepare their land use sections of their comprehensive plan. And one, um, the definition of a com community commercial center, which totals 30 to 40 acres, is to provide a wide range of goods and services within a 2.5 mile radius. The community commercial center should be dominant land use at the intersection and may abut multifamily and even single family residential areas. Not all corners of the commercial core, um, community commercial center should be devoted to commercial uses. And then they also talked about neighborhood commercial centers. Since we already are very close to a public shopping center across the street in, in Fort Myers that is less than a half a mile away from the intersection of Del Prado Boulevard and Dina Vera Parkway, we are, we've considered us to be a neighborhood commercial center which consists of seven to 20 acres, which should include only one corner of a collection, a collector intersection, and the remaining corners are appropriate for other land uses like multifamily residential. We have reviewed this on the comprehensive plan analysis and we are consistent with chapter three, the housing element, chapter four, the future land use element um, for multifamily development, consistent with policy 1.5, consistency between the zoning and land use once the zoning is rezoned for a multifamily development. We are consistent with policy 1.6, a housing policy for housing stock. Policy 1.7, which identifies a shortfall of the multifamily residential housing stock in the community. And we are consistent with policy 1.13, commercial notes. This is a very important um, policy and we disagree with city staff on this. In this policy, it says the ideal pattern should be characterized by a one-to-one -one ratio to the width and the depth of the parcel. So when we look at this, so our parcel corner intersections, if you look at the top, um, top, side, top right hand, left hand side, it's, it shows that our roadway, the entrance roadway was established when Dina Vera Parkway was constructed. That is our roadway. That is our connection point to Dina Vera Parkway for this entire subdivision. And if you look at that commercial note, it says one to one. So in the pink area, that's what we would be required to provide. One ratio for the length to the width. And the same thing on the other corner, on US 41, if you look at the ratio of the length of our property on Long 41 to the, to the width, that's what we would be required to provide for the commercial node, to meet the commercial node requirement. If you look at our exhibit, we're far exceeding that. We're way deeper on US 41 to have that commercial component, and we're way longer on Del Prado Boulevard um, to have that commercial node area. So we increased it to the north, and we increased it to the west, and we definitely increased it from the intersection of the US 41. At this time, I'd like to ask Michael Price to come up. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Price, and I am the director of the Land Brokerage Division for LandQuest Commercial. I represented uh, Dave Famey and Acorn on the acquisition of this property in 2018 and have been actively marketing this site for sale since that time. Prior to our time being involved, uh, the property was marketed for sale on and off since roughly 2010, coming out of the downturn. We have spent the last five years aggressively marketing this property far and wide, trying to gain interest from qualified parties. Over the last five years of outreach and in-depth discussions with developers, we have had zero interest in this property with regards to building any kind of retail power center on this property. 
as previous, uh, previous plans had called for. I cannot emphasize enough the lack of interest at any level from developers for that specific use. And I can assure you we've tried. The absence of interest from the type of tenants that would anchor and fill such a center have made it unfeasible to develop this property into a several hundred thousand square foot uh, power shopping center in this trade area. Coupling that with the cost to develop and construct such a project, which is estimated to be roughly $200 per square foot in hard costs and soft costs, uh, not including the land. So if you include the land, that would push that per square foot price upwards of $280 a square foot. All this while competing with rents ranging from single digit values up to the high teens on existing retail space for lease in the immediate area further decrease the viability of such a project. In addition, uh, we did run some CoStar reports looking at available retail in the area. And if you take a five mile radius of this site, CoStar report shows 266,000 give or take, square feet of available retail for lease on the market today when looking at the trade area. One of the many important note, points to note is the lack of frontage, like Dave and Linda said, uh, and access on US 41. The total site features 2,800 feet, give or take, on Del Prado Boulevard, while only having 220 feet of uh, frontage on US 41, again, with no access to US 41. This creates a major hurdle for retailers looking at that major corridor. It has only been in the last year or two that we've started to gain serious interest from and entertain the multifamily use on this portion of the project. Incorporating the multifamily portion into the project is a driving factor in making any of the proposed retail out parcels, out parcels viable as well and surrounding commercial. We would have loved to have sold this property to a commercial developer, um, but we cannot force the market to accept a use or project that is not feasible in today's market. The plan that has been designed and proposed calls for what we to be, uh, believe to be a market correct plan, very similar to a multitude of different projects within Southwest Florida. Thank you. Thank you. I just also wanted to let you know that we have um, an experienced team as part of this development team. We um, have Paul Owen from Owen Environmental who did a complete environmental study. We're working with TR Transportation which did a complete traffic study for this project. We also have architects that we've been working with for the commercial components and also the multifamily. In summary, um, we believe that this request is consistent with the city's comprehensive plan in all aspects of it that there's adequate utilities and public services um, to accommodate this amendment. This amendment will support and assist in the projected population um, within this area of the city and increase the tax base. These residential units will support the existing commercial uses and create the demand for other commercial development in this area on the tracks that are undeveloped. And just to point out one thing, remember the, lay the layout of this site, we're long with no access on US, for, uh, US uh, 41 and limited access on, on Del Prado Boulevard. The corners, the main corners of this project have been maintained for commercial deeper than the requirement of that. And we stand by to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. This is a public hearing. I'll now open up to public input. If there's any members of the audience that wish to speak, please direct yourself to the podium and state your name for the record. Seeing none, we'll close citizens' input. I'll turn it over to the commission. Commissioner Rafkin. A question for uh, city staff. The uh, current owner mentioned that he had the support from the city to move forward. Uh, was this from a different area of the city? Uh, where did that come about? Uh, so uh, they had done a pre-advisory meeting, um, or sorry, they had done a pre-application meeting before this. Uh, I wasn't a part of that. I don't know. It, you know, for me to say one way or another would be sort of hearsay. I don't know what we saw is what the comments were provided. Um, it, the comments were given that in order to do this, you would have to do a land use map amendment. Uh, I can't speak to whether or not someone said that the city would support this, not support this. But I will say that from a staff's perspective, um, and we've taken cues from city council as well, is that within the past um, 
two years or so, there has been a strong sort of desire to maintain the existing uh, commercial tax, you know, commercial designation that's been within Cape Coral. Um, so, like I said, I don't know what was, I don't know the exact words that were said. Um, I don't want to speculate as to, you know, what was what was there since I wasn't at that meeting. Um, but, you know, there's sort of like a, a known, you know, component that we're really trying to preserve our commercial tax base, not, you know, uh, have it change to multifamily, unless it's like areas that are um, completely appropriate where we've done some city-initiated changes where um, you can see that maybe it's it's just not going to work out. But for an area like this with French on with a, with on a new road arterial roadway, um, I have I find it hard to believe that we would say yeah go ahead we'll be you know uh, you know all for this kind of thing. Another question is on the access availability there on 41 or lack thereof. The question is therefore if you're going to produce these apartments with the increased traffic, and of course you got more students and things like that that we've talked about before. Is there a concern if it's with the multi-use and the apartments that there's going to be too much traffic created in that area for that uh, particular situation? I mean, the, the roadways there can support it um, in terms of you know the capacity that's available. Um, I can't speak to what the capacity on US 41 is because that's, that's obviously not a city-maintained roadway. Del Prado at that area does have capacity to support either the commercial or the multifamily component. Um, as to US 41, it's hard to say what, you know, what um, I believe it would be FDOT would allow there or what, you know, what their capacity is. But I would imagine that given that you don't have an existing, you don't have a ton of development that's there, um, as in other areas of US 41, they've also probably got adequate capacity to, to handle either commercial or multifamily uses there. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Any other comments from the commission? So once again, uh, I'm, I'm going to echo, I understand the city's desire to preserve and expand commercial land in the city, which we have a, a dearth of. However, uh, this mixed use corridor here uh, has not seen development in years and years. Um, and it does make sense that the proposed uh, land use change here would ultimately result in something that does look similar to the desired mixed use if indeed the commercial out parcels are developed in the future. Um, so not ideal, um, but somewhat in line with what the, the use I believe the city is looking for. Uh, those are my comments. If there's nothing else from the commission, um, do we have a motion? I would move to approve. Motion to approve uh, ordinance 51-23 made by Commissioner Severson. Do I have a second? Second. Question. No. Question. My question is, uh, is, the, is the... We have yeah. a second. We'll, we'll have to take a roll call. We did have a second. Okay, now we'll, so we do have a motion. We can my discuss my question is, what, what is the resolution? Is it to to accept the staff's recommendation? The we'll to go to the motion maker. Yeah, my understanding was the request for the <coughs> approval of uh, changing mixed land use to multifamily. Is that the, is that the correct? That is ordinance fifty one twenty three would provide would approve a that what they'd like to do. That is correct. What the developer and the landowner yeah. have proposed in this ordinance. Correct. You're, 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 the, the motion is to approve Ordinance 51-23, which would change the future land use uh, to multifamily. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank okay. you. Fantastic. Uh, with that, we'll move forward. Madam City Clerk, will you please call the roll? Apking? Yay. Sorry, sir, can you repeat that? Yes. Botana? Nay. Marker? Aye. Severson? Aye. Summers? Aye. That's four ayes, one nay. Motion carried. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is citizens' input. I will now open 
to citizens input any members of the audience wishing to speak please direct yourself to the podium and state your name for the record seeing none we'll close citizens input moving on uh, item nine staff updates are there any updates from staff Seeing none, we'll move forward. Other business, uh, is there any other business to discuss? Seeing none, we'll move on to item 11, member comments. Are there any comments from the members? Seeing none, uh, moving forward to item 12, date and time of next meeting. Uh, the next regular meeting for the Planning and Zoning Commission is scheduled for Wednesday, July 12th, 2023 at 9 a.m. in Council Chambers. And we'll have a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. None opposed? This meeting is now adjourned.